Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. If you want to do one good deed today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. Keep bowling, the pro shop will fix it? Okay. I'd forgotten about this until recently and thought I would share. I think it fits in here. It isn't a huge thing, but it resulted in me getting something I wanted but couldn't afford and then winning money with it. When I was younger and through my early to mid adult years, I was an avid bowler. 200 plus average back when that actually meant you were good before the bowling ball technology boom which comes into play here. And I worked at the local bowling center from the time I was 16 through 21 or so, and then again later on in my early 20s, working the back, pin setters, front of the house, etc., so I knew how things operated, what could go wrong, etc. I was bowling at a different center one day. The first frame, after each shot, my ball came back with a small nick out of it. Nothing major, but yeah. So I put that ball away and brought out an old ball that I never used but was in one of my bags. Next two or three shots, another nick each time. Fourth frame, it finally came back with a fairly large chunk taken out of it. Usually that means that there's a nail or a screw that's worked its way loose and the ball's catching on it or a piece of metal is broken near the ball lift and is cutting into it. I take the ball up to the counter and tell the manager and show him what had happened. Now, I was only four frames into the game and said I would move, and he said no, they couldn't move me as they had a party coming in and no lanes available. He said just keep bowling and the pro shop will repair the ball. I asked if he was sure. He said yep, he'll go in and tell them to fix it and the center would pay for it. Most pro shops are individually owned and operated, the owner rents the space from the center. This was no exception. Now, having done simple pro shop work, I know for a fact that there's no way it can be fixed if I keep bowling with it and this keeps happening. One gouge can be repaired fairly easily as long as it's not in the track of the ball. The track is the contact point where your ball rolls down the lane, so anything in that line just can't be fixed and will throw off the ball as it rolls since it can't be perfectly rounded back. Depending on the core of the ball and how you throw it, the track can be 3-4 to four inches wide as the ball flares going down the lane. But massive, multiple gouges all over the place? Nope. So I keep bowling, two or three games, knowing that I'm getting a new bowling ball out of this. Of course, the huge chunks keep coming out of the ball. I get finished and there probably isn't a 2 by 2 inch section of the ball that isn't damaged. I take the ball into the pro shop and the conversation goes. The pro shop guy says, what the heck happened to this ball? Did it get hung up in the pin setter or something? I say the lane I was on damaged it each time I threw it. The manager said you would fix it. The pro shop guy says, why did you keep bowling? I can't fix this. I say the manager told me to keep bowling after I showed him the first gouge. Pro shop guy then calls in the manager of the center. The pro shop guy says, I know you said he was bringing in a damaged ball, but did you tell him to keep bowling after you saw the damage? The manager says, yeah, we couldn't move him, so I told him to just bowl out his games and you would fix it. Pro shop guy says, I can't fix this, you're going to have to replace his ball. The manager says, what? Bunch of arguing back and forth about why it can't be fixed, the ball I have they don't carry, etc. He says, fine, replace it with anything on the wall except for the Excalibur. The Excalibur was almost 50% more expensive than regular bowling balls. It was the first reactive resin ball on the market. Reactive resin is a compound that made the ball hook much, much more than a traditional urethane ball. It revolutionized the game, and ruined it according to some since it allowed an average or below average bowler to suddenly improve drastically due to not having to be anywhere near as accurate and took a lot of the skill from the game, but I digress. I say, so I can pick any ball other than Excalibur and you will pay for it, drilling and all? The manager says yes, and I say, okay, thanks and the manager leaves. I say, can I have store credit for that ball on the wall, but then apply it to the Excalibur and I'll pay the difference? The pro shop guy says, sure, we can do that, and proceeds to measure my hand and drills the ball, and I pay like 40 bucks for what was then between a $150 to $200 ball that I could not have afforded at the time. Bowled my second ever 300 game with it less than a month later, and won two center tournaments with it and a bunch of high game pot money during league play. That ball paid for itself 10 times over in the first two months. Although this is a malicious compliance, this is more like OP just making a pro move at the very end. I don't know if I would have had that mindset to be like, can I just pay the difference? 
and then you pay a cheap price for the big, shiny, amazing thing. If you found yourself in that situation, do you think that option would have even popped up into your head? Or am I overestimating what OP did here? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Labernum Mount. The free water cup that ended up not being free. A drive through tale. I just went and picked up some food from a chain I worked at briefly years ago, which reminded me of the story. I hated that job, but I still love their food. I was working the drive through when a regular customer drove up. He was a catty and rude fellow who worked at the mall next door, so I had dealt with him enough to know that he was a jerk and to not even bother trying to give excellent customer service because he was just not a friendly person. He gave his order, which included a cup of water. No problem. Sure thing. We prepared his food, bagged it, and I started to pour his water. He got to the window and started fussing at me immediately because he needs a bigger water than that. That cup's tiny and useless, and I have to have a bigger cup. Let's talk about our cups for a moment. I'm assume, I assume you all know that a fountain soda machine is extremely inexpensive to run and is highly profitable. It costs about four to seven cents to fill a cup. Drinks cost money because the cup itself can cost more than the beverage itself. Our soda cups come in small, medium, and large. Then we had a free water cup, which held about one cup, about 230 milliliters. It's small, I won't lie, but it was free. And I get wanting to minimize food costs from a business perspective. I start explaining to him that the free water cups are this size but he interrupts me before I can tell him that I can go ahead and give him water in one of the bigger cups, which I did on a fairly regular basis, and he starts yelling at me about how stupid that is and how he'll pay for a bigger cup. Malicious compliance time. But first, let's talk again about our cups. The small was big. Medium was bigger. The large was a swimming pool. Seriously, it's a giant cup. It costs about $2.50. He didn't say what size he wanted, only that he'd pay for a bigger cup. I grabbed the large cup, added the cost to his total, and stared at him on the water laboriously trickled out of the spigot into his cup. The machine had very low water pressure without the carbonation, so it took a while to fill up. It was nearly full when I made a mistake. I swear I didn't mean to do this, but I accidentally got the cup too close to the spigot next to the waters and a giant splash of dark colored cola ended up in that very nearly full water. I looked at him, said oops, poured it out, and started over. The time dragged. Oh, how he glared at me. I had tried so hard not to laugh or look smug. It was awfully difficult. He was so rude and impatient, and if he hadn't been, I would have just given him the darn water in a bigger cup, and all that time wouldn't have been wasted. Whatever. He deserved it. I feel like this kind of just goes without saying, but if you treat people badly and you just have a bad demeanor, you probably shouldn't expect good customer service. And you know what probably wouldn't help? Doubling down on that crappy behavior and calling them out on bad customer service when you're the one from the subset that was giving them bad behavior and just kind of stressing them out. This next story is by Slickster PSV. Don't follow company policy? Got it. This happened years ago, I was working for a retail chain doing overnight stocking. I don't need to name names, you can guess what one. The store was brand new. We were paced on how fast we were going being compared to another store that was smaller and had been in function for 15 years. Stock these shelves, here's 6 pallets, it should take you 15 minutes per pallet. If you can't fit all the product, send it back. Don't put it on the shelf at all, the area leads will figure it out. These pallets were 6 feet high with over 30 boxes. When we went through the computer training, it was advised to rotate stock. Come on, this is normal. Pull old product forward and new in the back. After the first month, our overnight manager was screaming at all of us asking why it was taking an hour or two per pallet. Overnight manager came over and watched us and asked why we were rotating the food stock. We, team, said that's what the training said to do. Overnight manager said that we don't have time for that and we're spending way too much time on each aisle. Overnight manager also asked about why so much product was being sent back. Team told her that she told us specifically that if a new box won't fit, send the whole thing back. The team would get to 15 or 16 items and then not have room for the last one and send it back. Cue malicious compliance. One morning, I'm taking pallets back and an area lead asks why her aisles are pretty empty. I tell area lead that overnight manager told us if we can't fit it all to send it back. 
Area Leads pissed because now she has to stock it and do pricing adjustments. Area Lead sees a new label on a can of food and all the old ones behind and asks what the heck. I tell her that overnight manager said we don't have time to rotate food. Area Lead's mouth is a gape. She says okay and to have a good morning. That night, one of the mid-shift managers and store manager is there to talk to us. A quick powwow. Store manager and mid-shift manager says there's been an excess of food that's being thrown away because it's expiring due to lack of rotation. Team chimes in and says we were told by overnight manager to not rotate food. Overnight manager looks like a deer in headlights. Mid-shift manager ignores the comments and says for us to rotate stock. The night ensues and we get yelled at for taking too long. The store manager takes overnight manager to the side and reprimands her. Overnight manager then moves everyone to different locations in the store and says we will be written up if we don't complete our tasks in time. I ended up quitting a week later. Found out that overnight manager was sent to another store. The kicker? My friend and I went in and grabbed a cartload of expired food and took it to the service desk. The mid-shift manager that started taking overnights was pissed. Mid-shift manager ended up having everyone come in and remove expired product and rotate food. Long story short, faster isn't better. It's definitely one thing to focus on some kind of metric that just looks really well and would probably get you some kind of recommendation, but you can't ignore some of the most basic rules of the trade in order to achieve that better metric. The overnight manager found that out the hard way. And our final story of the day is by Tommy Tronics. Mick Ken, the man's woman puts away outside drinks. Mick Ken gets more than he bargained for. This happened a short time ago when I got some cheap dinner at a famous Mick Cheap place. Not far from me, a woman was bottle feeding her baby when the manager, which I'll call Mick Ken, because he was a bit entitled, tells her that outside food and drink is not permitted. She asks if they offer baby formula. He says they offer regular milk. She says babies this young can't have milk from cows. It needs to be formulated for babies. He still insisted she put the bottle away or he will call the police. So she did. Then she undid her blouse and popped out a boob. This is in Michigan. Nursing women are protected and they are allowed to breastfeed in public. The consequence for discrimination can be nasty. Unfortunately, that McKen seems poorly informed about the law and didn't like how she exposed herself in a public place. And the whole time this was going on, not a single customer mentioned any issue with that woman or her public breastfeeding. McKen was the only one who seemed to take offense. You can't do that in public. Stop doing that and put your clothes back on or I'll call the police. She says, go ahead. I'm not going anywhere. The police actually come down to investigate a public nudity complaint. My friend and I stay around longer to see this go down under the guise that we needed more fries and more drink. The police took one look and told McKen, we can't do anything about that. Breastfeeding is protected under the law. McKen says, but she's showing her, you know, everyone can see her and everyone's disgusted by her shameless public nudity. I demand you take her away or something. The police say, law allows mothers to breastfeed. Besides, I don't hear anyone else complaining about her. Most patrons were ignoring her anyway. Per the law, forcing nursing mothers to cover up or move away can be considered discrimination, and the person or business responsible can be fined. I doubt the owner would be happy to receive a fine for violating the law and for misuse of 911 service. Not sure what happened afterward as McKen left the dining area rather upset, and I think he went to hide in the office. Considering the worker shortage, he probably won't be fired, but might get demoted to working in drive through window only. And the mother was able to continue her breastfeeding when we left. From the subset of the story, how ridiculous is it that somebody walks up to somebody bottle feeding their baby, actually looks them dead in the eye and says, you can't bring outside food in here. Outside food? This is a baby. I'm not going to buy something off the dollar menu for an infant. This is the kind of moment where you go out of your way to leave some kind of review. On the receipt, there's a survey you can fill out. You would go there, you would get that person's name, you would make sure you put it in there and just rip into them. I'm sure that the people that would read the surveys would love to hear about how they called 911 over somebody breastfeeding and how they basically broke the law and left the company liable for a fine. 
But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So of all these stories I've read today, which is your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.